Welcome to Feminine Roadmap Podcast. I'm your host, Gina Farrar. Each week, I bring you an inspiring conversation to help you navigate the challenges and changes of midlife so that you can not only survive, but thrive in your second half. Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. It is Gina here. And today we have a conversation for solo agers. My guest, Sarah Zeth Geber, is a nationally known expert in the field of planning for the next phase of life. And she's the author of Essential Retirement Planning for Solo Agers. She's going to be talking to us about how to prepare for a later life when you're not as able to do quite as much as you have been able to do. So if you don't have children, and you're aging, this conversation is going to be a powerful resource to help you age with confidence and wisdom in how you live your life. So Sarah, thank you so much for being on my show today. Thank you for inviting me, Gina. I'm happy to be here. You know, you're the first person that I've had this conversation with. And so I would love to just kick it off with Obviously, you're a solo ager, which has inspired you. But tell me a little bit how you got into talking about this and becoming an expert in this field. Sure. Um, About, I would say about 10 years ago, I started noticing that people were talking more about their retirement plans and wanting to think about the future, wanting to figure out what they were going to do after they left their primary career, and really kind of looking looking toward uh, an older life. And the other thing I noticed about the same time, and we're talking midlife here, 50-something 50, 50 late, uh, 60s, which these days is pretty much midlife, uh, people were taking care of their aging parents. Some people were spending a tremendous amount of time and money and other resources, sometimes taking a leave from their jobs just to take care of a parent who was getting older and was having trouble shopping or having trouble uh, having to give up their driver's license, couldn't do things for themselves anymore. So I watched that go on around me with so many of my friends. I, I had lost my own parents when I was in my 30s, so it wasn't something I thought much about. And uh, I am married, and my husband also had lost his parents early on, so we just didn't think much about it. But here were so many of our friends flying across the country, just talking about it a lot. And at one point, I said to a friend of mine who also doesn't have children, I said, Sandy, who's going to do that for us? And of course, <laughs> the answer was crickets, as they say. <laughs> uh, there really is no one to pick up the ball, no natural kind of adult daughter <laughs> is the way the senior housing industry likes to talk about it, because it's almost always the women that are the caregivers that rush in when there's an emergency, that make the decisions. I I don't want to shortchange men because I've known a a number of men who have done the same thing, especially when they've been the only living adult child. They are like a safety net. Now, I would love to have (laughs) a dollar for every time somebody has said to me, well, I don't want to depend on my children or I'm not going to depend on my children. And that's a great sentiment. It's always advantageous for everyone to plan ahead, to think about where they're going to live, what they're going to do, who they're going to be with later in life when they don't have quite as vibrant and kind of large life as they do today. Because our lives do shrink. Um, that All that travel that you may be doing in your 60s and 70s, that's going to diminish when you get into your 80s and 90s. At least for 95% of the population, it goes way down. You may have to stop driving at night. Uh, you may have to stop driving altogether somewhere in your 80s or early 90s. Most people do. So and it, it's great that we're going to have Uber and Lyft and all those services and maybe some self-driving cars. But in general, we really have to understand and uh, absorb the idea that our life is going to be a little more confined. It's going to shrink some. So 
that's where, um, that's kind of how I got started. I initially was doing retirement coaching. Uh, I don't do that so much anymore because now I, I kind of speak to a larger audience. But once I discovered that solo aging was, as I say, a thing, and as far as I know, I'm the one that coined that term, although it's being used um, pretty regularly now, I initially envisioned a solo ager to be someone like me who didn't have children, even, even people who are married, because after all, you don't, one of you is going to predecease the other. And then you are going to be totally alone or your husband or spouse is going to be totally alone. So my husband and I both plan to be solo agers because we don't know which one of us is going to truly be the, <laughs> the last one standing, so to speak. So that was kind of the genesis of it. And the more I talked to people about it, the more I wrote about it, um, the more I realized that it was, it was something that people really needed to hear about, consciousness needed to be raised about. And the research told me that, amazingly, almost one in five baby boomer women did not have children. And that's not a guess. That was some research that was done by the Pew organization, who they are a research organization, and they do a lot of lifestyle research. And they based it on the numbers from the 2010 census. Well, in 2010, the youngest baby boomer women were just cresting their mid-40s. It's about the end of childbearing years. And they were able to pretty quickly determine that women of that age and older, at least in the baby boom generation, 19.4% um, of them had not had children. That's a big number. <laughs> when you look at baby boomers and you think, wow, one in five of these women hasn't had kids. Now you may say, well, what about the men? Well, you know how it goes. We don't really know. <laughs> we can't really measure it for men, but pretty sure there's a corresponding number out there. It's interesting really to think about because culturally, I think we're moving toward a culture that's waiting longer to have children, and many people are continuing that trend of not having children. They are. Now, interestingly, the numbers have uh, the numbers of child free, I like that term better than childless, because for the most part, it's a choice. Now, for some people, obviously, it wasn't a choice, and many women out there wanted to have children and then somehow found they couldn't. But Subsequent generations are having more children, more children than the baby boomers. So where we had a peak at 19.4, it's now down around 15, 16%. And there's a couple reasons for that. Gen X is part of this, but primarily millennials, because of course millennials are almost as large a generation as baby boomers, where Gen X was much smaller. So, but as the years went by, it became more and more acceptable for women to raise children on their own and even to just have a child and decide to raise him or her by themselves. So some baby boomer women did that, but usually because of divorce. Today, of course, you look around you and, and I have, in fact, two nieces who have children, but they don't have husbands. One of them has never had a husband. She just wanted to have children. So it's much more societally acceptable. And well, we're sitting here in California. It's more <laughs> acceptable here in California. And I think it's more acceptable. People are more forgiving about that um, elsewhere in the country as well. So it's, it's the, the peak. Boomers were the peak of that, at least so far. But we don't know what the future is going to bring. And it's still much higher than our previous generations. Previous generations, about 10% of women didn't have children. That was, that's been standard for hundreds of years because they were in some way infertile. But the 19.4 uh, the reflects really a, a choice more than anything among baby boomers. Mm. What do you come across, Sarah, as kind of the primary things that solo agers are struggling with or thinking about? What are those topics for them? I think one of the, the big discussions that I get into with people and that people, questions that people ask me in, in my public appearances and when I do workshops is, how can I ensure that I'm going to have the care I need as I get older? Because 
after all, when you, we all hope that we won't need care, but statistically, 70% of us are going to need some kind of care by the time we're in our mid-80s. Uh, maybe it'll be short term. Maybe we'll just need a knee replacement or some kind of uh, surgery, or maybe we'll take a fall and, and need to recover from that. But statistically, a lot of people, as they get up into those years of the 80s and 90s, especially, need some kind of help with um, what's known as the activities of daily living, which is which are things like dressing and grooming and eating and transferring from the bed to, to a chair or, um, as I say, toileting. Um, help is, is sometimes needed. We, we end up not quite as mobile as we had been. And it's a, it's a gradual process, but for most people, when they get into their 80s, they kind of look back and go, oh, yeah, I can't walk as far as I used to. Um, it's really hard for me to get those dishes down from the top shelf now because I've got some arthritis in my elbow or my shoulder and just things just begin to happen. And they, uh, sometimes they happen all of a sudden, sometimes they happen kind of gradually and sneak up on you. So the key question becomes often, where should I live? How should I live? With whom should I live? And of course, when you look at the uh, the women of the baby boom generation and successively, because now uh, Gen X women are getting into midlife, the, the oldest of them has already received their first AARP magazine. So there, it's a question for them too. But many, many women have lived very happily, very independently for years. We've had meaningful work. We've had some meaningful relationships along the way. But a lot of women have lived by themselves for many, for many years. And so it's, it's so much easier to just think that you're just going to continue doing that happily. It's just not always the case that we can continue doing that happily on into our 80s and 90s. And let's face it, a lot of us are going to be living into our 80s, 90s, and beyond. Women today, if they reach the age of 65, have better than a 50% chance of living to 85 and beyond. So if nothing takes you out before the age of 65, you're you're probably good to go uh, into your 90s. And so many people are living beyond 100 now. Yeah, I was going to say that statistically we have midlife is moving back later because so many people are living longer, which creates an even greater need for that kind of environment, mindset, and planning because that is becoming. Like they're saying that the baby boomer is a huge generation. So you have all of these people and if 20 percent of a giant chunk doesn't have that kind of support system in place how do they go about sarah preparing themselves facing that difficult fact in a positive way well they need to do three things they need to focus on uh, in three particular areas sometimes we can imagine a kind of a three-legged stool um, the first is finance making sure that you have enough money to maintain the lifestyle that you enjoy. Now, probably the easiest way to do that is with a couple of visits to a financial planner. And there are lots of financial planners around. Sometimes they get a bad name because in the past, they were famous for putting people into all these different funds that benefited them more than that benefited their clients. But today, um, that's it's really a whole different field now. And most financial planners work as fiduciaries. Um, Most of the states that they reside in and are licensed in enforce that they work as fiduciaries, which means they have to put their clients' interests above their own. And they work by the hour. They don't work off of commissions from the funds and, and things that they put you in. So you can, without much trouble, find a financial advisor or financial planner that will Take a look at your finances. What is your income? What is your outflow? How much have you saved? What kind of retirement plans, if any, do you have? And plug them into some very, very fancy algorithms or spreadsheets that will determine, will your money last you? 
until you're 102, let's say. And most financial advisors are using a number of somewhere around 100 to calculate that because there's such a good chance that women particularly will live well into their 90s and maybe hundreds. So depending on what the answer is, you may have to and may find reason to change your lifestyle a little bit. Maybe you need to downsize in order to save a little more money. Maybe you need to work a few more years than you thought you were going to need to, to accumulate more of a cushion for your older life. And of course, today, a lot of people have no real desire to have the kind of classic retirement that some of our parents did and people before us. There's so few people now that have those traditional retirement plans, those defined benefit plans that we have been on our own for years to save the money we needed for retirement through an IRA or some kind of a plan that we set up ourselves. So making sure you have enough money to get you through is important um, and making the changes necessary in how you live and how you spend your money to make sure your money will last. That's number one. Number two, and not in order of any particular importance either, but I'm calling it number two, is making sure that you have what they've always called, have your affairs in order. <laughs> that means that you need to have a will and possibly a trust, an estate or a, a life planning attorney can uh, give you the best advice on that. And there are some very good ones out there. Again, people are often quite scared about the money that attorneys cost to just as soon as you walk in the door. But actually, I think with a little research, you can find some good attorneys who have a kind of a package that you can purchase from them where they will set you up with a whole estate plan, which generally means a will, possibly a trust, um, an advanced directive for health care, and the power of attorney for your finances. And that means that you'll have to choose someone in your life to have your power of attorney for finances, because if you can no longer make decisions about how your money should be spent, or you can no longer pay your bills, someone needs to do that for you. You may be incapacitated at some point in your life. We all, of course, hope never to be in that position, but we have to assume that that might happen. So that's the second thing that's important to do. Now, the um, area agencies on aging, which exist in every county in the U.S., can help with that because they usually have attorneys, not on staff, but they have, um, they have attorneys that they work with that do this for older adults um, for a reduced fee. So if that's something that you're struggling with, how do I afford all this? See your area agency on aging and, and uh, or it's sometimes called the council on aging and they can help you with that. So those are two biggies that I, uh, I don't ever say too much more about because that's not my field. I'm not a financial planner and I'm not an attorney. I just know that those two people, uh, those two entities are very important in, in everybody's life. Uh, the third thing is what I do um, get into talking about in much more depth, and that is to make sure that you have a strong social network. Now, most of the time, our social network develops around work. It can also develop around your church or synagogue or mosque or wherever you go to worship. So it, those are the two primary places where most of us look to build our social network. Sometimes it happens in our neighborhood. Uh, those of us that live in neighborhoods that are conducive to that kind of thing, to, to really building um, a community, are very lucky because that's what I advise everybody do, to relocate themselves, if necessary, to the kind of living situation where you can build a community around you. And there are lots of different ways to do that. There's um, some that are, as you know, many decades old and some that are kind of new ideas like co-housing. And I, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about what these different ones are, but one very simple one is um, mobile home parks. <laughs> uh, they may or may not exist where you live. There's loads of them in California where Gina and I both are. And they are amazingly conducive to building community. 
And the reason I know that, I don't live in one myself, um, but I'm, I'm a big fan of them because it seems like every time I do a talk at a senior center or a church or somewhere where people kind of, they're not an intact group. People just come to the, to hear me talk about solo aging from various places. And I seem to always have somebody that lives in a mobile home park. And they have told me how wonderful it is to live in a community like that because they have potlucks and movie nights and they share a lot of, um, of what's going on with them because they see each other on a regular basis. When you live in a single family home on a cul-de-sac somewhere in a suburb, you know how that usually goes. You come and go in and out of your garage. You drive to work, you drive back home. You may never even see your neighbors, let alone know your neighbors. And for many people, um, now that we're in this sheltering in place and we're in the midst of this pandemic, people have met their neighbors that haven't known their neighbors for decades. So that's kind of been a silver lining that people have gotten to know those in their neighborhood. But our neighborhoods today, our suburban neighborhoods are not very conducive to building community. And that's what we need to have as we get older is a community. Now you can make that up from almost any kind of situation that brings people together. You may build a community, you may have a community, a kind of a social network now that involves people from your place of worship, maybe some people from your neighborhood, maybe you're in a book club or a quilting club or some kind of um, a hiking club. And you may have friends from all of those places, plus you probably have some friends from work whether or not you're still working, maybe some of those friends from work are still your friends, and those are all part of your social network. But think about which of those people is, is going to be with you, who is going to be kind of following you <laughs> into an older age. Where will your social network come from and what of your social network today will take you into that older age? One of the interesting things that, that I've heard from a number of solo agers is I've had a really good friend. We'd been friends for 25 years. Um, we worked together at one point and then we didn't, but we stayed friends. And, you know, we used to get together for lunch a couple times a month and we've even gone on trips together. But my friend had children. And when the grandkids came along, she moved. You know, after 25 or 30 years, I thought I was going to grow old with this person, but she moved to Kansas City to be near her grandkids. It, it was devastating. So I, it's this cautionary note that you may have some really good friends that do have kids, but I'm here to tell you those kids are going to come first. So that doesn't mean that your social network has to be all solo agers. It just means you need a bigger social network. We need to build a community around us that has enough padding. I always think about the, the uh, royal expression. I guess this came from the Brits. Um, we need to have an heir and a spare. Well, you need to have a friend, a bunch of friends, and some spares. Um, because things happen as we get older. People move away. Some people uh, predecease us. We're going to lose friends to, to cancer, to all kinds of things. So bolster that social network where and when you can. Um, I also encourage people to, as much as possible, develop relationships with younger people, younger men and women around you. Now, that might be nieces and nephews. Um, when solo agers say, well, where, you know, where do I look for somebody to, to uh, be my, uh, to have my power of attorney? Where do I look for somebody to name on my advance directive for my health care? I always say, look first at your extended family. You may have some nieces, probably nieces, maybe nephews that you're close to or some that you would like to be close to, especially if they live near you. They're very viable candidates. Now, of course, you know, they need to be good, functional, upstanding adults, which not everybody is these days. So you need someone trustworthy and responsible and someone who you believe is, is uh, honest and will have your best interest in mind. So look, look first to family. Um, but beyond that, if you don't have family that fits that bill, 
then you're just going to need to look around you at other sources. And the, probably the most ready source of people would be your place of worship. Now, I know I'm talking to some people who haven't been to a church or synagogue in decades. I was one of those people. <laughs> and uh, my husband and I are Jewish. And uh, recently, we decided to join a synagogue. And we did so not because we wanted it so much for religious purposes, but because we wanted to bolster our social network. Uh, we recently, well, five years ago, we made a move to uh, a different area. We were living in Silicon Valley when we were uh, both working at previous kind of work. And then we decided to move up into the wine country of California. So we've been here for about five years now. And that was one of the things we did. We joined a synagogue and we've made some wonderful connections, really good friends. And I know that they, they will be a big part of our social network as, as we get older in this area. It's an incredible journey that life is, right? You yeah. work, you, some people raise families, some people build businesses, and we're so busy being about the living of life in certain seasons that I think a lot of people lose track of relationships in that process. And I think what I hear you saying is it's time to start recognizing what does your social circle look like? And yeah. I love that you're talking about the potential to still build that. I think yes. sometimes the mindset is, well, I don't have any friends, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah. it, it's a good idea to think about opening up your mind to that social network, but even people who have children, you know, the support, that community piece, I talk about it with different guests on all different topics. There's something about that building community that supports living in a healthier, happier way in more ways than one, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's important for everybody. And, you know, after I had been talking up the whole raising awareness of, with people about solo aging. And before I wrote the book, people would inevitably come up to me and say, well, I do have kids, but I still see myself as a solo ager. This was especially true of divorced women and men. They'd say, you know, I, I just have a, a child that I don't think I can depend on, or all I have is sons and not daughters. And they're, you know, they're going to go where their wives' families are. And some people who have children who live many, many miles away, you really need a social network that is close to you. I mean, physically close to you within an hour's drive. Um, that may not be important to you today, but in the future, it will be. So uh, think about that as you think about your social network. You may have some people that live further away, and that's fine, but you need some people that live close by. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of things like getting involved in your house of worship organization. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful house of worship here in uh, Santa Rosa where I live. I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's kind of church for people who have done with church. Um, the Center for Spiritual Living. And I think that there are branches of that all over the place. Um, at least, do you, do you know of one in your area, Gina? I believe there's one in Claremont, California. Okay. So Gina's in Southern California and I'm in Northern California. So we have different geographies. Um, but I think that, yeah, I think there are branches of that all, all over, probably all over the world. And so if you are someone who feels like you're just done with religion, done with a deity, uh, that's the place for you. It's all about building community and looking inside ourselves in, in a non-religious way. So there's, and many people today even uh, join their churches and synagogues or reclaim their churches and synagogues and maybe mosques or any place of worship. Um, just for that reason, for social reasons, not for religious reasons. So whatever your reasons are, uh, I encourage you to take a look at that because it's a wonderful way to build community. You know, as I'm thinking about solo aging and preparing and all of these things, 
I think they're difficult conversations for people to have, right? Is there a certain window of time that you feel is really optimal to make these decisions and to make that move? I mean, obviously you're living it all the way through. Yeah. But do you feel like there's an optimal time? Like if you're in this age group, that's when you strike really uh, hard at the yeah. preparation. I think probably somewhere in your six in your sixties, if you haven't thought much about it by then, it's time to start thinking about it. Okay. And by the way, it, it's important to identify the people that you're going to name on your life plan documents, your estate planning documents. But it's also important to have those conversations with those people because you don't want to just name a, a niece on your um, advanced directive and never tell her. <laughs> so make sure to have those very, very important conversations about what that means that she's been named. Is she okay with that? Um, and she might not be. Um, I know a number of circumstances where people have said, you know, just I'm not the person for that. Don't name me. I don't deal well with these situations or whatever they say. But have the conversations with whomever you choose, whether it's a family member or a younger friend at your church or a younger friend that you've known for 20 years in your book club. Someone who you trust and someone who you think will probably be around when you're quite old and will be in, at a somewhat younger age. I happen to have a cousin who's about 16 years younger than me, but she is one of the people that will be on my estate documents, which are right now my husband and I are in need of, of refreshing those because every five to 10 years, you should take another look at those. And we have some people on there uh, on our now aging ones that um, are not appropriate anymore. One has passed away and uh, one has moved away. So we need to take a look at that. You need to refresh those documents pretty frequently. Somewhere between five and 10 years is the right time to do that. And ours are about eight years old now. So we probably would have done it by now if COVID hadn't come along. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be in the business of doing that real soon. How many books have you actually written, Sarah? Essential Retirement Planning for Solo Agers is the one book of this genre that I wrote solely. Uh, I participated and I was a co-author on a couple of others. Uh, Not Your Mother's Retirement was one of them and Live Smart After 50 was another. I'd love to hear about that book, Live Smart After 50, because I think the bulk of my tribe is somewhere in their early 50s to early 60s. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Uh, it came out in 2013, and uh, it's, it was published by an organization that I've been a longtime member called the Life Planning Network. And you can look them up online if you want. The Life Planning Network is for professionals, primarily professionals whose work involves older adults. So if older adults are your clients then you're a good candidate for LPN. And I was in that position when I was doing retirement coaching. Um, there are, are financial planners in the life planning network. There are estate attorneys. There are uh, long-term care uh, providers, insurance people. There are other, um, there are therapists and coaches. Uh, it's a kind of a hodgepodge, but it's been a great organization. And at one point, I, I wasn't one of the people at, at the uh, <laughs> the germination level of this idea, but about five people got together and decided that they needed that we needed to publish a book, and I was invited to participate, and I co-wrote uh, the chapters on relationships and on housing. So I highly recommend it. It's uh, available on Amazon. It's like my book. It's usually. 13 or $14 on Amazon, um, readily available, live smart after 50. What are the key elements of living smart? What does that mean? Well, planning, of course, is part of it. And all the things that I've been talking about so totally apply to people with children as well, making sure that your finances are in order, making sure that your estate documents are in order, making sure that you have a social network. Um, there's a, a big section in that book, a chapter on spirituality, reclaiming 
who you are doing some values clarification, kind of like we did when, uh, when we were just trying to sort out what kind of career we wanted to have somewhere in college. Um, a lot of people do the same thing as they're getting ready to move into their retirement phase of life, which of course is so different than it has been for previous generations. There are lots of people working well into their 70s and some into their 80s. Uh, some people by necessity because they don't have the money to fully retire and others because they love what they do. And then there are still many, many more people who walk away from that eight to five job and start a business, buy a franchise, <laughs> become an Uber driver. There's just the whole world kind of opens up when you leave your career of 25 or 30 years and want to do something different. And many people do. Many people just decide, you know, done, been there, done that with the midlife career, want to do something else, want to finally have my own business, want to finally open up a hobby shop, what, whatever it might be. There are more entrepreneurs over 50 than there are under 50. Interesting. Yeah. And I think when I look back over the people that I've talked to, that conversation just in my life is people really start to think about what do I want to do? It's like, we've lived this life of what we should do, right? Mm -hmm. you, you get the job, you, the career, you build the ladder, whatever. And there's this point where we tip toward, wait a minute. You feel that awareness of time differently after a certain age, I think. Yeah, yeah I think so. And do you find that you have conversations about reinvention with people? I do. Um, when I was doing retirement coaching, I did much more of that. Um, Live Smart After 50 is very much about that, about reinventing yourself. Um, there's also many other wonderful books out there uh, to help you do that. A lot of people are probably familiar with the many iterations of what color is your parachute. And there is an edition for retirees as well. Oh, is there? It's a specific edition. Yeah, I believe there is. You know, I haven't thought about that in so many years, but I'm pretty sure there is. Mm. What has been your journey, Sarah, moving into this season of your life? Yeah, I, it's, it's a good question. I, for 25 or so years, I was a management consultant. I did a lot of leadership development and team building and executive coaching. Um, and toward the end of that, I was doing more executive coaching than anything. And I started to hear so many of my executive coaching clients wanting to talk about their retirement plans. And so I thought, you know, there's something in the air here. <laughs> and a lot of them were about my age. They were early baby boomers. And uh, so we would talk about that. And I got so fascinated with it that I, after a few years, I decided, you know, maybe it's time for me to make my own shift into a, a different different kind of career. And I was fascinated by the retirement transition that people were going through. So I actually wound down my uh, consulting practice and uh, went through a program to learn more about the psychology of the retirement transition and to become a certified retirement coach. So that's what I initially did. And I started my business, which is called Life Encore. And then a few years into that, I started down this solo aging path and I've kind of never looked back. <laughs> I think it's an important conversation. Before we hit record, I was sharing with you that finding people that are having specific conversations to midlife isn't as easy to find as I would think, because we're talking about a generation that's a huge portion living in this season of life, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, your conversation is even more specific. And with what you said, almost 20% of people in the solo aging lifestyle, right? That is the way their life is going. These are such important conversations. Yeah. In, in finding those people that are like you, if you will, so that you can have those conversations. Because it seems to me you can have that conversation with someone who is not solo aging and they won't understand it in the same way as someone who has 
the same circumstances as you. That's true. That's true. I find that most women, because there are, you know, one in five women didn't have children and baby boomers, at least based on the census, I find that most people do know plenty of solo agers in their family, in their work circles, just among their friends that they have today. There are loads of solo agers around. So now, you know, not all solo agers have the same, are in the same situation. Um, I have a, a longtime friend, actually from childhood, who was the fifth girl in the family of all girls. And she became a scientist and never married, never had kids. But her sisters all did. And they all stayed around the same area. She knows her nieces and nephews very, very well. And it's so she is less a solo ager than others who just don't have that kind of family support. So she's someone that I just don't worry about at all. She knows because she's listened to me talk and we've had personal conversations. She knows she needs to choose, and I think she probably has by now, choose a couple of those nieces or nephews and talk to them about being her advocate if she got into a medical emergency. So for some solo agers, they're not as isolated. And it just, you know, everybody's situation is different. On the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, I know solo agers who have absolutely no family whatsoever. They were only children. They never knew any cousins. Um, and they're just, once their parents were gone, they're it. So they really need a, an entire um, crafted social network and community. And, and so most of them have, you know, taken that in stride and they've gone about doing that. That's so interesting. Like I was processing before out loud, which is we go about living our lives and doing life as usual, if you will having the job, doing the thing. And there does come a point where we kind of have to make it our job to prepare for a different kind of future instead of building the career. We you know do. what I mean? We do. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that many times this is the hardest for people that consider themselves loners or introverts. And for people that live way out in a, in a rural environment where they're, they're really quite alone much of the time and they like it that way. And I've had a number of those people show up at some of the talks that I've given and they, and we have some difficult conversations. They'll say to me, you know, I don't really like people. I don't want to be around people very much. And so I don't, I'm not inclined to go live in, um, in a mobile home park or in a, in a high rise apartment or a condominium. I'm just, that's not me. And I said, well, you know, you have to make those decisions for yourself, but know that there's going to come a time when you're going to need some help. You're going to need someone to, to do things for you. Or I got very graphic with this one fellow who came to a, a, a conference session that I was leading. And, and he said, well, I don't intend to do that. I live 10 miles out of town and, you know, I like it that way. I'm going to stay there. And I said, then somebody's going to find you someday and you will have been dead for two or three days. Some, somebody will find you somewhere. You won't have anyone to call. And I said, that's okay if that's the way you want to end up. I, I totally believe that everybody should have free choice in that. If that's what you want your end to look like, you know, who am I to tell you otherwise? But realize that a rural life as an 80-something or 90-something-year-old is pretty tough. That didn't happen 50 years ago. Anybody who even lived to that age lived with family. And that's what's not happening today. I was just listening to something that was talking about culturally what used to be the norm or culturally what is the norm around the world is not necessarily the norm here in the United States. Mm -hmm. That family dynamic, that independent spirit that we have is so strong here. It's not a bad thing, but it's just different than maybe the way the rest of the world navigates 
the aging. It's yeah, although the rest of the world is changing too. Mm. Places in the world that we always thought of having a very tight family structure, um, it's changing for them too. I mean, you have only to look at, at China where young people move away. They move away, same, they move away to, for jobs. Uh, same things going on in India. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, grabbing the whole world in, in, in some ways. So now it, it's really becoming more of a global conversation then. It is. It is, yeah. It's interesting in my mind, I just keep picturing people getting together and like creating this conversation like having meetups about solo aging and, and mm -hmm. beginning to have those difficult conversations with people and having guest speakers. Like I picture this whole, you know, it, yes, it's expanding your social network, but it's also expanding the conversation to make it more comfortable and more normal because it is a personal thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that might make some people feel a little too vulnerable. Do you run into that? Yeah, some people are more reluctant than others to talk about these things. It's the same with end-of-life conversations. It's very similar. Um, I, I encourage everybody, I have a whole chapter in my book on end-of-life. I think we all need to start talking about that. We all need to start acknowledging that, that <laughs> this life does come to an end, and we are going to be older people, and then we're not going to be around anymore. And somewhere along the line, we will have a period that we call end of life. Now, everybody wants to go the same way. I have a, 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 a wonderful friend that I've known for 30 years, and she said, you know, here's what I want to happen. I want it to be happy, 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 dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all want that, <laughs> but that's not the reality of life. Most people have a, a, some period of time when they are dealing with a terminal illness, or they're, they've had, um, I have a, a friend right now whose 94-year-old mother has been living in a continuing care community for about 15 years, loves it there, but she's finally, she's starting to just experience some organ failure, and they've, uh, she's in hospice care now, but she... Um, you know, she's acknowledging that this is this is the end of life and this is what it's going to look like for her. So she's going to have a kind of a long, slow decline. Um, may or may not be some liver cancer in there, but she's beyond the point where they want to do some kind of exploratory surgery. And that's what her end of life is going to look like. We don't know what our end of life is going to look like. We might get hit by a bus. We might get into an auto accident, we might get cancer, we might, who knows? I mean, there's just so many ways that people experience their end of life, but we need to start talking about it and, and planning for that. So, yeah, that's another part of it too, because you're going to, if you don't do the planning, you're going to leave a mess for somebody and not sure, you know, in anybody's case who that would be, but some family member is going to have to step in and pick up the pieces. Um, I was lucky to have a father who knew that uh, early on. I think when he was in his 50s, he bought his own burial plot. Uh, he and my mother were divorced by then and had already prepaid for all the end of life kinds of, of mechanical things that have to happen. He kicked out his coffin. He'd done the whole bit and he dragged me practically kicking and screaming when I was in my 20s up to uh, see the the memorial park where he had his plot and and talk to the the head of the mortuary there and I didn't want to do that I fought him tooth and nail and then he explained to me he showed me the will he explained where everything was how to find all his paperwork and you know when he did die about 20 years after that um, he was in his mid 70s so by today's standard, he didn't live a real long life. And he had a fairly short decline. But when he died, I knew exactly what to do. I knew who to call. I knew where the paperwork was. I, and we're talking 30 years ago, so there was actual paper. Um, <laughs> today, you need to make sure that somebody has your passwords for all of the things that you keep locked up in a digital vault. 
Um, these are all considerations that previous generations didn't have, um, but they're, they're important. So those people that are going to help you with end of life and are going to be, have your advanced directive and power of attorney, they need to have some digital information too. So that's something I sometimes forget to talk about. It is interesting how time, things just keep changing how we do things. And I just spoke to someone about this very thing. And she was talking about creating a binder and putting that information in there and giving it to the people so that they are prepared in advance. And your father gave you such a gift. He really did. Oh, he gave me an amazing gift. And I, I talk about that often. When I am um, speaking to groups of people, I always use that example because he was such a wonderful role model for pre-planning. It just, it's the greatest, those of you who are listening who do have kids, it's the greatest gift you can give your children to do this planning, to have the discussions with them. Difficult as they'll be, they'll fight you tooth and nail, just like I did my father. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to talk about death. I don't want to think about you dying. But they will be eternally grateful to you when the end comes. Mm, Yeah. And that would be even as true for someone who is not a blood relative that will be taking over these tasks. The less decisions they have to make, of course. the less of a burden it is, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You want it to be turnkey for somebody. Mm. Yeah. Well, Sarah, we are rounding the hour that we've had together and you have shared some really great and encouraging, empowering conversation with my tribe today. Just some things to think about at least to start the process toward what we try to, I think, we feel it's difficult and it can be painful and we feel vibrant still. So it's hard to have that conversation in reality. But like you said, we don't know the the number of our days. So how can we really make this almost like just get it done and have it in place. And then you don't have to keep having the conversation, right? Exactly. Exactly. Just do the work and then enjoy your life. Yeah. So If we had to kind of give people three things to really anchor in on, you may have already said it, what three things would you really want them to take home from this conversation that you feel are the most important? Get your estate planning in order, get your financial plans in order and make the adjustments necessary and pay attention to your community, build that community, figure out where you need to live, Figure out where, if you're living right now, is going to be appropriate for you, nurturing for you as you get into your 80s and 90s, and make the changes that you need to make now while you're still young and can still build a new social network, can still build um, a new community around you, and really start to get serious about it. Mm. And there's a certain, I think, mental ease that comes right when you do the preparing and then you don't have to keep putting it off almost makes it bigger than it really is. Right. Yes, it does. Causing your own suffering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Sarah, I want to, again, thank you so much for being on the show today and for being willing to share such important conversation and a conversation that's not necessarily out there circulating as it should be. So I'm really grateful that you've come on and shared today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. So today I've been speaking with Sarah Steph Geber. She is a nationally known expert in the field of planning for the next phase of life. And she's the author of Essential Retirement Planning for Solo Agers. If you head over to www.femininroadmap.com dot com forward slash episode 185 you will find links to sarah's website and to her books while you're there please leave your name and email address i send out periodic encouraging emails and i have a gift for you as well friends if you or someone you know is solo aging please share this podcast with them please go to instagram and follow me at feminine roadmap 
please subscribe to my podcast, check out my YouTube, share these resources with people. Feminine Roadmap is here to help create support, encouragement, and empowerment to those of us who are in midlife. And all of these conversations, when we have a resource to share, it makes it easier to have. So I want to thank you for joining me today on this conversation. I thank you for sharing it with your community. And I look forward to talking with you again next week. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye.